بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد <تصفيق> وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد although the plight has made me speak to you I find speaking to you of little value but I find scolding you is great therefore I'll continue to scold you the eyes are tearful and the heart is sorrowful. How ironic it is that the members of the party of Allah are killed by the members of the party of Shaytan. The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allah. Second loud salawat in honor of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib Al-Asr Wal-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah Wa Barakatuh. The prophetic pulpit, otherwise known as the Mambar, has been seen for many centuries to be the most important medium of communication of the beliefs of the religion of Islam. Wherever a person goes in the Muslim world, they'll see that there is a pulpit which has been erected in their local mosque. That pulpit which is erected in the mosque is a pulpit that becomes the main medium of communication of the tenets and the principles and the beliefs of the religion of Islam. If you go to the Middle East, for example, you'll find that irrespective of the sect from which you come from, or indeed the denomination, which is your background, you would have always heard a particular lecture from the pulpit. You would have heard many of the thoughts and the opinions of the scholars towards the masses from the pulpit. Therefore, that pulpit becomes no doubt of the utmost importance in the way the community thinks, in the way the community progresses, as in at the end of the day, that pulpit becomes the main form of communication to the community when it comes to theology, when it comes to law, but also when it comes to social issues. That pulpit, which originally was known as the member of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, later develops into being known as Al-Manbar Al-Husseini. And now, you find in the world today, there are thousands who sit on the Manbar al Hussein. You go to different parts of the world, and you'll see in the months of Muharram, and the months of Safar, that many of these speakers, in some cases you'll find some of the most renowned scholars in the world, will sit on this pulpit seeking to disseminate the teachings of the Prophet and his family, seeking to disseminate the teachings of the Holy Quran. By the same time, you find that there are a number of challenges that are related to the pulpit today. Because the reality is that when you look in the world that surrounds us, there isn't only one Islam. There is an Islam of the Middle East. There is an Islam of the Indo-Pak subcontinent. There is Islam of the West. There is an Islam of North America. There is an Islam of Australia, 
each of these different communities has different challenges that they face, as in each and every one of them faces a different context, a different issue that they need answers from. Those sitting on the pulpit are normally the ones who provide those answers. But the first challenge of those sitting on the pulpit is that they are fallibles representing infallibles. The reality is, for as many majalis or as many lectures that are given on the pulpit, the reality is that these lectures are the lectures of the worldview of a fallible human being. As in someone like myself may look at the Quran and may look at the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. I get the Thaqalain and I try and provide some sort of perspective on what is in the Quran and from the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt If I don't have the deepest perspective, then inevitably I will go towards whom? I'll go towards one of our maraja. May Allah lengthen their lives. I'll go to one of them for example. But even with them, most of their lectures are on fiqh or usul al-fiqh. If you look at what's discussed on the mimbar, most of what's discussed on the mimbar is either theology or history. Do you agree? Within theology, ilm al-kalam, or within history, tarikh, you have discussions of the lessons of the akhlaq that emerge from theology, for example, theological discussions that then teach us how to relate to them, or the akhlaq ethics of what emerges from our lessons in history. Most of our maraja will not necessarily give 100 or 200 or 500 or 1,000 lectures on Islamic history. If you look, for example, I do the taqlid of Ayatollah al-Sistani, may Allah lengthen his life. I cannot say that I've listened to a hundred majalis of Ayatollah al-Sistani on, for example, the biographies of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam I cannot say that somebody else has listened to Ayatollah Wahid al-Khurasani's a hundred lectures, for example, on the lives of Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Kadhim, alayhim salam Most of our knowledge of history will come from the pulpit, not from our maraja. Our maraja will provide us with lessons, for example, on fiqh and on usul al-fiqh. And they'll go into areas like Ayatollah al-Khu'i, for example, went into discussions concerning hadith, which within it envelopes certain parts of history. How will I know, for example, about the context of an imam in their lives without my understanding of, for example, their companions, when did their companions live, the historical context of Rijal, for example. But at the same time, you'll find that you might find someone like Ayatollah Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr delved a couple of times into history. So you have that our maraja delve into history. But where is most of your knowledge come from when it comes to aqidah or when it comes to tariq? Most of it has come from the mumbar. That's the reality. As much as a person revered Ayatollah al-Hakim, may Allah bless his soul, who passed away a couple of weeks ago, if I were to ask everybody listening to this majlis and the many who are listening at home how much ilm did you gain from ayatullah al-hakim reality is that the mumbar has more power in some cases than even one of the most revered maraja of the 21st century the marja for example may provide me with guidelines even outside of fiqh and usul they may provide me with guidelines like ayatullah al-sistani did when he gave the fatwa a number of years back in relation to ISIS. That was a guideline. But once again, that doesn't necessarily mean that Ayatollah Sistani will provide all the lessons throughout the year in Muharram or Safar or the Mawalid or the Shahadat or the Munasabat when it comes to the occasions relating to Ahlul Bayt Who is it that you refer to? You refer to the Khatib. You refer to the Zakir al Hussein. Isn't that true? In many cases, if you see most people in the Shia world, they refer to somebody who is at a particular level. That level may be because of their ilm, but it also could be because of their oratory. It could be because of their charisma. It doesn't necessarily mean that that person is the most knowledgeable, but that person is somebody who's trying to provide a perspective on that mumbar. That perspective remains fallible. That perspective remains fallible and in many cases the ones who question the perspective or the ones who discuss the perspective are fallibles discussing fallibles do you agree 
So if someone like me, for example, gave an opinion from the manbar, most people who may agree with me will be fallibles, you'll find, who in some cases are not even students of the religion. Some will agree with me. And even those who don't agree with me may not be students of the religion, but they'll give their opinion as well. Therefore, what do we have? We have that the manbar faces its first challenge, and that is the reality of fallibility. That when a person comes up to give an opinion, on the manbar, that opinion that they give is an opinion of a fallible in the middle of fallibles. Ever since the ghaibah of the 12th Imam, the reality for all of us is that we've lived in a religion where 1,100 years of this religion is made up of people who are not ma'soom. Do we agree? As in if Islam is a 1,400-year-old religion, 1,100 years of it is a religion, one may argue, especially in Shiism, which is a religion made up of non masums for the first 300 years from the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, until when? Until the ghaib of our Imam, that could, you could say is a period of Isma for the Shia. Our non Shi'i brethren, you'll see many of them, that they believe that at the beginning there was an Isma, but then even after that, they maybe believe in a period where people speaking on behalf of the religion are not necessarily ma'soom. Even though they're not ma'soom, they still have probably the most important position in Shi'ism. If you name the most renowned personalities in the world outside of the maraja, most of them are the ones who you listen to their majalis. Whether you listen to Urdu majalis, or you listen to English majalis, or you listen to Arabic majalis, or you listen to Farsi majalis, 20 names you could gather together who between them have six to seven figures of hits throughout the year. Those people, therefore, highlights the manbar how important it is today. That one may argue that the direction and the vision of tashayu depends on the manbar and its worldview. A manbari can literally make or break a community. Do we agree? You can have a manbari who can build a whole generation. You look at, for example, Sheikh Ahmed al waili may Allah bless his soul, built a generation on his manbar. But also you have in Urdu, someone like Rashid Turabi built a generation based on what? Based on his lectures, for example. Then you have, for example, in Farsi, there are a number of speakers who built generations based on their majalis as well. So on the one hand, what we have is we have the importance of the manbar. On the second hand, what do we have? that social media dictates that now it's scrutinized more than ever before. Whatever we say on Manbar is scrutinized. If now I discuss Abu Bakr, or I discuss Omar ibn al-Khattab, or I discuss Uthman bin Affan, or I discuss Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, or I discuss Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, when I discuss this, now every single point that I make about them is available Within a few minutes in Saudi Arabia, do we agree? Within a few minutes, it's available in Pakistan. Within a few minutes, it's available in Oman. Within a few minutes, it's available in London or in America. It means that now when we discuss from the Mumbar, there has never been a period in the history of this religion where literally everything that's said on the Mumbar can literally be heard across the world. Do we agree? Like globalization, and how the internet has made the world so small that now whatever you say on the pulpit of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, everybody in Mozambique, straight away they can hear. People, for example, who are in Europe, straight away they can hear. That means there's extra responsibility on the people sitting on the mumbar. It then means that we face a challenge in the Shi'i world. That challenge is where does the mumbar head in the 21st century? Because at the same time, one may argue, we as Shia have never had it better than now. In 2021, I sit here in Iraq. I ask the Iraqis who are sitting in the audience, could I sit here in 1986? Could I sit here in 1993? Could I sit here in 1981? Could I sit here in 1984? Well, I wouldn't even dream of sitting here. Probably half, if there was a crowd, half of them would be the ones who would probably lynch me after the lecture. That lynch means that, subhanAllah, I've been blessed being lynched. That means I've got away with it. Reality is, 
that acid wouldn't be too far away for a person who tried to listen to Majalis al Hussein alayhi salam in this particular area. In London, we can have Majalis 24 7. In Pakistan, likewise, I've had the honor of lecturing in Pakistan and lecturing in India. And you see everywhere, Julus one way, Majalis another, Sabil another, Azadari another. So what do we do with the Mambar? Do we, for the first time in our history, leave the world of Taqiyya and actually speak? Or do we, no, stick to the guidelines that are given to us that, look, you shouldn't speak about these issues. Speak about Akhlaq, for example. Some of our brethren in the Khalij, when I look at their lectures of their speakers in the Khalij, I look at the topic, the heart in Islam, being a good human, being a good brother, being a good neighbor, then I can tell definitely that there's censorship in those countries. Because you look at those topics and you're like, mashallah, they're nice topics, but you've done them for seven years in a row now. I've understood insania inside out now. And therefore you found that this question arises. Likewise in our communities, is it anyone who we invite to sit on the manabar as well? Is there a filtering system for this? As in now I see somebody who sits on the manabar, for example, has no credentials whatsoever, but has the credentials of oratory, has the credentials of a nice voice, and now they sit on the manabar. Is that enough? Is that person worthy of sitting on here? Or should there be a criteria? There should be. Who sets that criteria? So therefore you found that this issue of the Prophet's pulpit becomes one of the utmost importance. After that intro, I'd like to dissect it in depth tonight. And I'd like to do it in the following stages. Number one, that member of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Why was it built in the first place? And how was it built? Number two, how did the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt السلام, stress on the importance of the pulpit. Number three, how did the member of the Prophet evolve into the member of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? And the member of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, did it begin with lectures or was it something a lot more simple? And how did the Imams look at the Majalis gatherings and those who attended them? Further than that, how did the Shia then evolve the pulpit? And how do we see that evolution in the period of the Ghayba? After that, when we come to looking at the pulpit, is there a filtering system or can anyone just sit on it? How about extremism? How about sectarianism? Should we discuss Saqifah and Fadak and Jamal and Ghadir or should we remain away from these issues completely? If we do, then how do we answer Allah in relation to those who were oppressed? And how do we answer Allah in relation to our children further than that what's the future of this mambar and can there be a reform from a monologue to maybe a dialogue and what other areas may one consider reform did the ahlul bayt ever give lectures of a sectarian nature if they did what was the context of them and how did the pulpit of imam al hussein alayhi salam emerge with the sister of imam al hussein alayhi salam Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. We all know the word, some pronounce it as mimbar, and some pronounce it as mambar. comes from nabara, the idea of something being raised or something being elevated. You found that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, when he used to sit with his companions, if you imagine, I'm sitting with all of you on the ground. I'm not sitting three, four steps above you. When he would sit with them on the ground or on the floor, you would find that sometimes people would come from outside who've never met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa It's not like technology today. If you say to someone, have you seen Sayyid Ammar? He'll say to you, yeah, I've seen Sayyid Ammar online, for example. I know how he looks like. But in the time of the Holy Prophet, if you came from Ta'if, or you came from Najd, or you came from Abyssinia, you've never met the man. So when you actually come, you've heard about this man, that there's this man, for example, in Medina, and that this man, I really want to meet him. When they used to come, they used to see the companions around him. They couldn't tell which one was him. Of course, in some cases, if you are pure hearted, then the likes of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari will know who you are. But others may not necessarily recognize who you are. 
And so, when that would happen, there was a request to the Prophet, peace be upon his family, from the companions. Do you mind if we, out of clay, make a bench for you? A bench, so that you sit on that bench, it's elevated, and that everybody will know that that is the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. That bench became, later, a form of elevation for the people known as the Mambar. There was a lady in Medina by the name of Aisha. That lady in Medina, she came to the Prophet and she had a request that, Ya Rasulullah, when you give the Friday sermon, can you give the Friday sermon on a more elevated pulpit? And that's why she had a Roman slave, if I'm not mistaken, or a Turkish slave by the name of Yaqum. He came, he built that mambar. Therefore, you had that the Holy Prophet moved from giving talks on the ground to giving talks on a bench elevated to giving talks on a mambar. And that's why whenever we go to Medina to visit the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, you'll see that in Masjid and Nabawi, everybody wants to pray in a certain area. Yes. What's the area that we all seek to pray? The area that's known as the Rawdha. مَا بَيْنَ بَيْتِ وَمِنْبَرِ رَوْضَ مِنْ رِيَاضِ الْجَنَّةِ Between my house and my mambar. Look at the word mambar because whenever people ask me that this word mambar, he sat on mambar, he's going to mambar, get the mambar. This begins with who? With the Prophet peace be upon his family. Because you go to Medina between where his mambar is and where his house is. The Holy Prophet says رَوْضَ مِنْ رِيَاضِ Subhanallah, that there is a piece of Jannah in that area. First point is that when we say Karbala is a piece of Jannah, why do you doubt it? We say that Karbala is a piece of Jannah. People say, look at these Shia, they are extreme in their beliefs that they say Karbala is a piece of Jannah. Well, hold on, why if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could give us Hajar al Aswad from Jannah on the earth and Allah could give us the rawdha min riyadh al-jannah, a garden of the gardens of jannah on the earth. Why can he then not put another piece of jannah next to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? Firstly, secondly, that rawdha min riyadh al-jannah is not just to be dismissed that between the mambar and the house is a piece of jannah. No, that could easily be where Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam is buried. Nobody knows where Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam is buried. And there's a reason that just in case you thought that I died a natural death, ask them, where am I buried? If it was such a simple natural death, everyone should know where I'm buried. But nobody knows. But one of the possible places where she is buried is where is between that particular location. Why? If the grave is a garden for the believer, is there a greater believer than the true mother of all believers? That garden area could easily be the place where Fatima al-Zahra is buried. Therefore, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says what? When he says, مَا بَيْنَ بَيْتِ وَمِنْبَرِ رَوْضَ مِنْ رِيَاضِ الْجَنَّةِ That means that the mambar in the time of the Prophet would be where he would give his khutab from, he would give his sermons from, People would attend from far and wide. Sometimes he would sit. Sometimes he would stand because you could give a lecture. And this is something not to be dismissed in 2021. Some of us can give talks by sitting like this for an hour. Some of us, no, maybe could reach a stage where a person can take a mic and walk around. A person can be innovative. At the end of the day, when we come to the khutbah of Salat al-Jum'ah, we see that a person stands up. Maybe a person can stand up as well. The Prophet would always insist, try and elevate whoever is speaking. And that's why even on the day of Ghadir, bring all the saddles, bring the, everything together, make a pulpit so that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam can be seen by everyone. They would always have this pulpit ready. And that's why you found that after the Prophet died, peace be upon his family, the first Khalifa, the second Khalifa, others, they would come and sit on the Mambar of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. According to some justified, according to Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam, on one occasion making it clear, get off my grandfather's pulpit. That pulpit is my grandfather's pulpit, not your grandfather's pulpit. 
So you found different people would occupy the pulpit. Even Ahlul Bayt many times they would have sermons, they would have khutab. When the Prophet's pulpit then emerges as Imam al husseins pulpit. Interesting that now you hear al Mambar al husseini the Husseini pulpit. What is the Husseini pulpit? Husseini pulpit in reality emerges after Karbala that people begin to talk about what happened in Karbala to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam or about Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. You found, for example, Zayd bin Arqam talked about Karbala. Hassan al Basri talked about Karbala. It's a for three days in a row. They talked about Karbala. That, in a way, explained that when people wanted to talk about Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, they would gather together and they would sit on a pulpit, for example, and talk. But those were not majalis the way we had them. Please understand this delicate point. Imam al-Sadiq when he was talking about majalis in those days or the pulpit, I don't think Imam al-Sadiq necessarily sat on a mambar with people under him and gave majalis al Hussein the way we do them. Imam al-Sadiq would have talked about theology, would have talked about law, would have talked about the fadila of ziyarat al Hussein alayhi salam, but in many cases, what was the majlis at that time? The majlis at that time was Imam al-Sadiq would sit with his companions. For example, Fudayl, the son of Yasar. Fudayl, the son of Yasar, Imam sits with him and he asks him, Do you people sit together and do you gather and talk amongst each other? He replied by saying, yes, we do. Imam said, inni uhibbu. I love these types of gatherings, yes? May Allah have mercy on those who revive our affairs. It's a crucial line here. May Allah have mercy on those who give life to our affairs. Meaning that sometimes the teachings of us, the Ahlul Bayt, may die. May Allah have mercy on those who sit and revive them. What became the aim of Mambar al Hussein? The revival of the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, and the Quran. When Imam says, Rahimallahu man ahya, amrana ahya is the most important word in this hadith. Why? Ahya means to give life. That means that even Al Muhammad's teachings, if they're left without reflection, Without contemplation, they could die. Because a person ends up doing what? A person ends up following stereotype uh, superstition. A person ends up following culture. No longer is it about Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. It becomes about their own culture, or their family's culture, or their country's culture. Imam says, Rahimallahu man ahya. May Allah have mercy on the one who gives life to our teachings. But then Imam also, the majlis, how would it be? Imam would sit and he'd ask poets sometimes to sit on the mambar. Imam would ask, for example, Ja'far bin Affan al-Ta'i. He'd say to him, recite poetry for me. You see how we had before I begun? We had the wonderful recital of Mullah Ammar. We had, for example, Ahmed, Muhammad Abbas. They recited poems in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Some of us call these nohas. Or some of us call this, for example, the shi'r related to Imam al Hussein, the poetry related. In the time of the Imams, what were the lectures in reality? The lectures in reality wasn't 10 nights Muharram, a person sits on member and gives much. No. Imams would sit with the poets. Ja'far bin Affan al Ta'i, Imam would say to him, Recite for me and remind me of Masa'ib al Hussein alayhi salam. At the beginning, it was purely Masa'ib. It was purely. Masaib. Today, I find some people saying, what is this all Masaib, Masaib? We want intellectual analysis. Wallah, the original majlis was Masaib, by the way. Originally, the majlis of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam originally was what? Was just to remind me of the Masaib of Karbala. Someone says, why? Why remind of the Masaib of Karbala? Does your heart not become soft when you listen to the Masaib of Hussein? When you hear about the arrow in the neck of that baby, does your heart not become soft? When you hear Abu al-Fadl losing his right, losing his left, does your heart not become soft? When you hear, for example, about Zainab being hit 
Does your heart not become soft? People don't realize that in the masaib of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, the Imams were giving us a hint that you can sit on a mumbar and give an intellectual analysis all your life. If you don't touch the hearts, then you've not understood what the aim is of Karbala. Karbala was to soften the hearts of the human because their hearts had become hearts of stone. So Imam would tell Ja'far bin Affan al Ta'i, recite for me poetry on Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Then you'd find Imam al Rida would tell Da'bal bin Ali al Khuzai. Da'bal bin Ali al Khuzai, by the way, was not an orator, wasn't a charismatic Mawlana. Da'bal bin Ali al Khuzai would give majalis. No, he would recite poems. Many of you have heard the lines of Fatima Law Khilt al Hussein Mujaddalan waqad mata atshanan. These are the lines of Da'bal bin Ali al Khuzai. I ask you a question. Imam al Rida alayhi salam, could he give the majlis? Of course he could. Imam al Rada alayhi salam could give any majlis. But Imam al Rada, like Imam al Sadiq, you know what Imam al Sadiq used to do? He used to tell them, recite for me Masaib, but with the voice of the people of Iraq. Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam, why are you asking them to do Masaib? Why don't you do it? When our maraja', for example, don't necessarily give majalis, you'll find even Ayatollah al Khu'i, may Allah bless his soul, he used to invite speakers to give majalis. He never himself used to give. Why? Some are of the opinion that he was saying that this person's oratory is better than mine. As in at the end of the day, Rabbi Shrahli Sadri wa Yasserli Amri Wahlul Uqdatan min Lisani Yafkahu Holy. Sometimes Wajali Waziran min Ahli Harun Akhi. Sometimes Harun might be more eloquent than me in this moment. It doesn't mean that Nabi Musa couldn't give lectures. But here, a marja says that, listen, this person, his voice will get to the people. He will make the people cry. That's why never be condescending to someone who sits on Manbar al Hussein alayhi salam and people cry from them and you're like, These, just because he has a nice voice, he's on Manbar. That voice is still a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That voice could have been used to be a singer. I'm telling you, the voice... Easily, someone like Mullah Basim al Karbalai could easily have become the top singer in the Middle East. Easy. But instead, he gave his voice to the Prophet and his family. When easily there are singers in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Egypt, their voices do not come near Mullah Basim. But Mullah Basim gave his voice. Instead of our people saying, Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, that we have someone like that. In the same way, Da'bal bin Ali al-Khuzai, Ja'far, and others were great in their poems. Instead, people want to say, these people, it's just their voice. Don't do this negativity against the one unless you know the history of how this developed. So the Imams, alayhim salam the Imams would sit and they'd get someone to recite Noha. Instill Noha in your kids. If your kid wants to come out as a Noha Khan or to recite Latmiya or Marfiya, all of this is Azadari in the way of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. A person should never limit Azadari to only Latum or Matam or this. No, this can also be serving food to the people is Azadari. Writing books is Aza. But the Ahlul Bayt used to love those who recite poems about them, especially about Imam al Hussein. And those who used to have nice voices in their recital. And those who used to make them cry. Imam al Rida would love to cry in Muharram in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So therefore, Majalis and the Mambar in the beginning was Masaib. When the Ghaybah happens, you found with the Buwayhid dynasty or the Buyids in English. You know, many times we don't discuss these dynasties that came after the Ghaybah. There are the Buyids and the Fatimids and the Ottomans. I know the Ottomans now has become popular because of Ertugul, for example. Before that, many people, if you ask them the Ottomans, what's, what's the Ottomans? But now when you ask people about the Ottomans, straight away, of course, I know the Ottomans very well, I know it inside out. Many of these empires, a person discusses, you found that in the Ghaybah, in the time of the Buyids, suddenly we begin to see a development of the Manbar, where we have maybe lectures which are given in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and Masaib. How many of you have come across works which are known as Amali? 
Amali of Saduq, Amali of Mufid, Amali of Tusi. Many of these are in English, by the way. You can order them online. These are the lectures given by Sheikh al Tusi, Sheikh al Saduq, Sheikh al Mufid. And within these lectures, there are wonderful discussions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, of Karbala. And mind you, some of us, some of us have to read some of these because sometimes the masa'ib that we recite in reflection of what Sheikh al Saduq and Mufid recited may be a bit different. You have to reflect back on those great ulama to see what is it that they saw about Karbala. What did they learn about Karbala? And so on and so forth. That develops in the Shia world for the next few hundred years until you had a period where in Iran, for example, you had the difference between someone who sat on Mambar, who's an Alim, someone who's a Dhakir, someone who's a Rawza Khun. A Rawza Khun, in some cases, according to some, the opinion came from where? Came from the Rawza or the Rawza to Shuhada of Kashfi. He wrote Rawza to Shuhada. He would, for example, talk about what happened in Karbala. Some of what he said is reliable. Some is not reliable, for example. And from there, people would develop and give majalis. Even in Iraq, the majority of lecturers in Iraq, up until 70, 80 years ago, majority of them, what were they? Majority of the lecturers were just the ones who recited Masaib al Hussein with some maw'idah. That was until the likes of Sheikh Ahmed al-Wa'ili came and suddenly there was even more of an evolution. What was the evolution? That you should have an intellectual analysis, theological, ethical, Quranic, historical for a certain period and then go into the musibah. Otherwise in the past, what was it? Musibah, talk, musibah. It became that the main substance was the talk. But even the likes of Sheikh Ahmed al-Wa'ili and the likes of Allama Rashid Turabi and others were speaking within a particular context. Sheikh Ahmed al-Wa'ili, majority of his majalis were either in Kuwait or they were in the United Arab Emirates. That's the majority of the majalis. I'm talking post late 70s. Of course, many of those in Iraq will remember Sheikh al-Wa'ili years before that was renowned for reciting all over Iraq. But after 78, 79 and the revolution, Kuwait, Syria, United Arab Emirates, sometimes London, he would recite lectures there. When you're reciting in Kuwait or the United Arab Emirates, some place like this, you cannot necessarily be so open on certain topics, nor even mention names. If you look at Turabi, for example, Alama Rashid Turabi, many times could not be too open about certain topics. Why? Because the environment that surrounds you is an environment where you're thinking that this mumbar, how am I using it? Am I using it to cause trouble between the Muslims? Or am I using it to do what? Or am I using it to bring people towards the religion? Or at least have love for Ahlul Bayt? Because Ahlul Bayt would always say that be what? Kunu lana zaynan wa la takunu alayna. That be a source of adornment for us, not a source of displeasure. Let the people come towards us and like us. Don't let the people go away from us. In that time, that period, could they be open with the names? Not necessarily, you couldn't. Why? That mosque would get shut down properly. And the Shia who were living there would not have freedom. So what you do indirectly... And Pakistani, Indo-Pak subcontinent, Urdu speakers do this until today. For one hour, they could give a lecture which is all in direct hints without mentioning the person's name. One hour. And do you know how much they want to mention the name? They keep going like that to the crowd. <laughs> and the crowd keeps going back like that to them. And you know that they want to say a name, but you'll see them, for example, saying, you know who I'm talking about. And the crowd says, we definitely know who you're talking about. That was because they had to, in a way, protect their crowd. They recognized that if they came out openly and said certain things, then they have to ask themselves the question, will it cause trouble or not? In the 80s in Pakistan, you had Sipa Sahaba, 
And you had Sipa Muhammad, Irfan Haider Abidi and others giving majalis, trying to reply back. And there was a period of munadara back and forth because they felt that they need to speak out. What then arises is this question. And that is, first and foremost, when we come to this question of sectarianism, this is the main issue about the Mambar and its development. That the Mambar, when it's developing now, of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, of the Ahlul Bayt, should this Mambar be a Mambar which is open on discussing certain issues, or should it be indirect hints? Let me explain to you why. If, for example, you see that a person hears my lectures that I gave, for example, this Muharram, they were very clear with the names. Probably the first time, one may argue, that someone came out very clear with the names, but without necessarily being insulting about it. That a person came out and said that the first Khalifa, Abu Bakr, done this, and Umar done this. This was the reply of the Prophet. Uthman done this, Aisha done this, and so on and so forth. That particular way of discussing certain things, which one is better? To say the names, but in an academic manner, or to spend an hour making fun of them without saying their names. Because there are some who say that if you say the names, you're going to cause trouble for us. Sometimes it's your speaker who's causing trouble for you. Because for one hour, he's making fun of those people without saying their names. People aren't stupid in 2021. They know who you're talking about. When you make jokes about them, you'll notice if an English speaker does it, people call him sectarian. When a non-English speaker does it, they call him Mawlana Saab. Why can we not? And that's why some people will say, but Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah lengthen his life. Some people say that Ayatollah Sistani says that we should stay away from discussing these sectarian issues. We shouldn't talk about them. But he also, the same Ayatollah Sistani says, that if it's done in a scholastic fashion, this is an important caveat. When people get guidelines from Ayatollah Sistani, they love to pick that which suits them. What suits them is that they'll say that, look, he says don't discuss these issues. No problem, you're right. If a person discusses Saqifah rudely, or Ghadir, or Fadak, or Jamal, and these topics rudely, then that is not what Manbar should be doing. A person should come forward. ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن. If I come here and rudely sit here and discuss what happened at Saqifah and make fun of people, like I've seen, in Urdu Majalis, for so many years, Mawlanas who've sat, who for one hour, they look at the crowd, the crowd looks at them, they're laughing, and they're joking. Baba, why don't you just say the names of who you're talking about and stop making fun and joking? Just discuss what happened. Say that this is your opinion, this is mine. If you respect someone who made fun of the Prophet or who insulted the Prophet, up to you. But I personally, that's not someone I revere. Therefore, when now we do that, if we discuss the first three, or we discuss early Islamic history, on the one hand, what do we have? Some people will say, but people will get killed if you do that. People, even they said to me, that are you not scared of, for example, getting killed by discussing such topics? First, you know, al-maut lana ada, death for us is a norm. And that a person shouldn't necessarily be scared. But also, secondly, there's a difference between these things scholarly and then making fun of people in that particular region. If you're going to make fun of them, you don't need me to give lectures. You're making fun of them for one hour, of them for one hour waiting for wah wah, wah 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 to come back from the crowd. That causes more trouble than a person who takes some of these topics and discusses them in the right manner without being insulting. Problem is, is, even if you do discuss these, what's the next accusation they put on you? British Shia. British Shia. CIA. Your CIA. MI6. 
MI5, MI4, MI, I don't know how many MIs there are. Your CIA, your British Shia. Why? This is one of the biggest oppressions ever done. That any time a person discussed Islamic history or the narrative of the Shia, straight away they were labeled British Shia. Us, the British Shia, have lived in Britain for way longer than others who came onto the scene who you may be referring to when you say British Shia. Some of us lived in Britain since the 70s. Some of us since the 80s. There are people who are British Shia who looked after Tashayyu' better than some people who are living in Muslim countries. How many Hsaniyat and Imam Bargas are in Britain? Anytime now someone emerges on the Mumbar who's from Britain, they paint him British Shia. Baba, British Shia, you have an issue with a particular personality who may be seen as a British Shia, say his name and cut the rest of us out. Otherwise, don't label every speaker. Here in front of me, I see speaker. Sheikh Noor, you're counted, although you're Ghanaian, may Allah bless you. But I know you'll find your way to getting a British passport. Sheikh Noor, Ghana, but he's Imam of a mosque in Birmingham. Sheikh Mohammed Halli sitting here in front of us. He's British Shia, but he's been in, Shia, uh, uh, in Britain for a long time. Everybody's labeled under the brush. Why? Because when they sit on the mumbar and they discuss some of these issues, automatically then the person is labeled as a British Shia. And further than that, they say that these speakers, and I have to reply to each of these comments, they say that each of these speakers or these speakers generally, these are speakers who are sectarian. What is sectarian? Sectarian means we discuss the volume against Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. That's sectarian. No problem. But every Shia speaker has discussed this issue. So why don't you label everybody who has ever done a Fatimiyya sectarian? Even Shaykh al-Wa'ili has poetry lines which a person, if they want to, can call sectarian. But those who understand Arabic poetry will understand. And those who don't understand, you just sit there and you say, Subhanallah, without recognizing but within his poetry, it could be taken as sectarian. Just because a person discusses these issues, you can't paint them as sectarian. And everybody else who discusses them is not. There's one mosque in London, for example. They say a speaker who openly talks about the first three caliphs, that speaker is sectarian. But then every speaker you've invited has discussed those caliphs. Then why is not every single speaker seen as sectarian? The point being what? The point being that we return to an issue. And that is, we follow the guidelines of our maraja, what comes from the mumbar, as long as our niyyah is what? To please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reward hopefully for those who are listening. That's number one. Number two, the filtering system. How can we filter who sits on mimbar? You can't. You can't. You can't filter who sits. The only way you can filter is in your respective mosque. Your respective mosque may filter who sits up here, who doesn't. Otherwise, there's no filtering system. I'll give you an example. There are some people who sit on mimbar today. The only reason they're sitting on mimbar and they're doing Islamic work is because they were high school dropouts. That's it. They couldn't make it in high school. They thought, you know what, let's make a path where we dress religiously. We maybe wear the dress and now they sit on mimbar al Hussein. Believe you me, the person has no interest in service except that this is a career for them. It's a career. There was no other career. So they found that I'm a high school dropout. I'm not going to get a job anywhere. Let me go to Qom or let me go to Najaf and I'll go there. And then I come to the people and I give Majalis al Hussein alayhi salam. Can I filter that person? I can't in reality. That person ends up sitting on the mumbar, and what was their whole vision or perspective sitting here? That they were a high school dropout, nothing more and nothing less. There are others who, for example, recognize that they may have a nice voice and they end up sitting here. Doesn't mean they're insincere. Maybe they recognize that they could be a good dhakir. But can you, for example, say that anyone who sits on mumbar al Hussein has been filtered completely? You cannot. Number three. Not everybody who sits on mumbar has the same perspective. But then how are fallibles meant to judge other fallibles about what is real tashayyur? What's real tashayyur? Tawheed, tick. 
Nubuwa, tick. Imama, tick. Okay, I believe in these three. Now when I come on the mimbar, I'm a fallible. I'm talking to fallibles. If I be very real with you about this, if I'm a fallible, talking to other fallibles, then when I'm talking to you, I have my perspective of the world, for example. I give you my perspective. Someone else has theirs. Can you come and say that my perspective of the world is wrong and yours is right? Because we have people who sit on the member who believe that them and their family are the only ones guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> there are some who sit on the member. Everybody is wrong but them. Everyone's a heretic but them. Everyone's a deviant but them. Everybody is dal but them. Every speaker is wrong except them. They have come as Allah's police on the earth. And the inconsistencies in their legacy of who sits on their mambar and who doesn't. People with the worst reputations, they put on there because they're their cousins. Or they're their family members. Worst reputations ever, with closets full of cobwebs and so on. They put them on there. Others who have never studied, not a day in the hausa, they put them on the mambar. Why? I thought you said that you have to study in hausa to sit on mambar. How come someone... Who maybe suits you is someone you put on the mambar. Or you need to look after their interests is someone you put on the mambar. In other words, what I mean is that even those who sit on the mambar do not be fooled by the fact that all of them are in unison with the same niya or that all of them are consistent or have the same opinion. And nor should we. I may differ with Sheikh Noor on an issue. And Sheikh Noor may differ with Sheikh. And we may differ with each other. But if our niya is sincere, and that is... The niyyah to get closer to the thaqalain. That's ultimately our niyyah. I sit on the mambar to get closer. Not to make sure my family's name is raised. How many times you see people who sit on the mambar? The most infallible people is not 14. You have to include their family in infallibility as well. That their family are ma'soom as well. So the mambar becomes what? My family versus the world. Everybody is deviant except us. And that is a reality. And it exists. And it's there. So therefore, can we filter who sits on that mambar? No. Can we say that everybody has to have the same opinion? No. Ultimately, even further than that, can we remove superstition and stories which are fairy tales on the mambar? No, you can't. I've seen people who've studied in Qom seven, eight years. Half their majalis are dreams. Seven, eight years in Qom. Half their majlis is dreams. Ayatollah Fulan did this, and Ayatollah Fulan did this, and he saw this dream. And wallah, I don't doubt that there are some great maraja who have seen great things. And there have been karamat. But some of it is like, you know what, give substance for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani dream after dream after dream after dream. There has to be a point when, for example, a person, but what do you do? Can you stop that person? You can't. What can you do? Is you can come and you can advise that person. You can say to that person, for example, that try and lean back towards the original literature and the original text. Further than that, can everybody, for example, when they sit on mimbar, can they all be perfect? Ah, this is important as well. Because now those who sit on mimbar, I could argue there is even more pressure on them. Why? Because of social media. I remember, uh, honestly, this happened just about a week ago. Someone called me and said, Sayyidina, do you drink champagne? I said, Astaghfirullah, what am I talking about? He said, I promise you, someone says that you were in Dubai with a famous boxer and you were drinking champagne. I said, really? Really? Yeah, we've reached that level? He says, but Sayyidina, the glass looks really like champagne. Yeah, you can't have apple juice in a glass. <laughs> you can't have grape juice in a glass. So I said, but Sayyidina, it's still this, that. I said, well, there's no more that I can answer you. If you believe someone who sits on the member of Imam Hussein alayhi salam can go. But the reality is as well that we live at a time where everybody's scrutinizing, looking for black dots on our lives. I cannot hide from that. But at the same time, you have to be aware of those who are trying to cause trouble between us as well. That there are people who actively are going around looking to bring people on the member down. They're looking to find, because you know, you see a white piece of paper and there's a black dot. The human says, why is there a black dot? Well, the whole paper is white. But if they see a black dot, but still, the onus is on people like us. That we have to ask ourselves a question where the mambar has developed, 
that some of us now, I see Sheikh Noor and Sheikh Hilli walking around taking selfies. They have Instagram followers. They have people who come and say salam to them. People who want their autographs. I asked you 20 years ago, would you ever go to a Mawlana and say, can you take a selfie with me? Would you ever go to someone who sat on the mumbar and say to them, can I have your autograph? Would it happen 20 years ago? No, it wouldn't. But now one may argue in one way, alhamdulillah, that people look at those who sit on mumbar and say, I want to relate to them. I like them. I follow them. It's better than having a pop star. Right? Sometimes you see people saying, Sayyidina, my kids, they love this music and they don't leave it. But then when they come to the Mawlana to take a selfie, we'll say, why is the Mawlana taking a selfie with them? So let them go to the pop star then. Reality is that even the position of the Mawlana, the position of the Mambar, has even changed so dramatically that now one may argue it's a new world even for those sitting on there. If it's a new world, does that mean we come and try and bash those who are in that world? Because it's unfortunate in our mosques where you find that people just want to fight each other over those who sit on Member Hussein instead of supporting and defending and helping that word continue to spread far and wide. But at the same time, there comes a reality. And what is it? That this member, in the same way it involved from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina to Member al Hussein to poetry to Noha to Marthiya, there might also come a time where the member moves, for example. Number one, we can move from a world of monologue to a world of dialogue as well. It may come a time where a person has a dialogue with their crowd, a question and answer session after the lecture with the crowd or after the majlis. The world may move in that direction. Why not? But also further than that, what's important, my dear brothers and sisters, is that the mumbar is only a source of reminder for us. Please understand this point. At the moment, the way the world is heading with education Mambar is only a reminder. We only come 10 nights, 20 nights, 30 nights, 40 nights a year. What's needed in our communities is a supplement to the Mambar. We need courses in theology in our local Imam Barga. How many people have opened the works of theology within our communities? Mambar is not going to open for you Saduq and Mufid and Nasir al-Din al-Tusi and Allam al-Halli. Our communities have to supplement the Mambar. Likewise, in the world, not just of theology, in the world of tafsir as well, there needs to be courses. And there needs to be these courses that supplement. Why? Because the challenges for us on the Mambar now are not challenges that can be met only by a monologue. There needs to be dialogue. Social media has to be used. Look, therefore, where the evolution of Mambar al Hussein has come to, subhanAllah, today. That from where it began, where... It began with Al Muhammad. And this begins the final question. Al Muhammad, did they ever have Alayhim salam Did they ever have lectures which were sectarian or no? Al Muhammad, Alayhim salam did they ever have lectures where they discuss sensitive issues? Or was the fact that Al Muhammad only had lectures which discussed, for example, akhlaq or discussed tafsir of the Quran, and that was it. They went nothing further than that. The reality is, that Ahl al-Bayt themselves, they had lectures which today people, if they heard them, they would say, why are you discussing these sectarian issues? Why not bring unity between the Muslims? Isn't that what we always hear? We are not against unity between the Muslims. On the contrary, we want the Muslims to sit together. But I have my narrative, you have yours. I, you want to say, for example, that Abu Talib is a kafir. I disagree with you, but it's your books, your narrative. You could say what you want. I have no problem with your narrative. You cannot bully me into not saying mine. Therefore, Ahl al-Bayt did Imam Ali ever have a sectarian type lecture? So what was Shak Shaqiyya then? Sermon 3 of Nahj al When he talks about those caliphs who came before him, Imam doesn't curse or insult. Imam says, by Allah, the son of Abu Qahaf addressed himself with the Khilafah. And he knew my position in relation to it was like the position of the axis in relation to the windmill. And then he began to talk about those who milked the others of the Khilafah. And how trials and innovation and tribulation came to Islam and then about how they said, become one of six for Khilafah. He said, when was there a doubt about me being the first? Now they want to make me the third? 
Imam discussed this. Why does no one call Ali ibn Abi Talib Ta'ifi? When Imam Ali alayhi salam discussed what happened at Saqifah, is he a Ta'ifi? When Imam Ali alayhi salam discussed the Shura of Umar, is he a Ta'ifi? When Imam Ali alayhi salam discussed the Bid'ah, the innovations that came after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is he a Ta'ifi? That's the Imam al Hassan in the Mushajara with Muawiyah and Amr ibn al As and all of them. When he began to talk, tell Walid bin Uqba, you are a Fasiq. And he said to Amr ibn al-As, Inna shani'aka huwa al-abtar, is the man you claim. Is Imam al-Hasan a ta'ifi? Was that not a sectarian lecture of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam? Imam Ali had lectures which they today would have called sectarian. The reality is they weren't sectarian. They were when haq spoke out against batal. They were when takabbur ala al-mutakabbur became ibadah. That is when arrogance against the arrogant became worship. That when the Imams began to speak out, when Imam al Hussein السلام, said to Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, on the janazah of Imam al Hassan, السلام, your father and his Farooq are the ones who brought trouble to the religion of Islam. Why does no one mention these? Only when Ammar and Naqshawani and others begin to talk about these, we are the ones who are sectarian. But when in the lives of the Imams they talk about those who oppressed Al Muhammad, who usurped the rights of Al Muhammad. I ask you, was there anyone more strong when it came to speaking out than Fatima al Zahra? Fatima al Zahra lost her life at 18 because she spoke out. Not just lost her life, lost her rib for speaking out. Not just lost her rib, lost her baby for speaking out. Why don't you ever mention Fatima speaking out? When you want to talk about Ahl al-Bayt, it suits you to say insaniya because it suits you, not the manhaj. I can appreciate if there are people who live in parts of the world where they face oppression, they don't talk about these, I appreciate, I respect. If someone is living in a part of the world where they cannot talk about these things, I respect that. Wallah, I'm not against it. But when I live in London in 2021 and I want to finally breathe when talking about Abna al-Hassan wal Hussein. صالح بعد صالح صادق بعد صادق أنجم الزاهرة شموس طالعة أقمار منيرة I want to open up on this you call us طائف for opening up when our grandmother taught us the meaning of speaking our grandmother didn't speak for herself that's not her she spoke for نبوة and إمامة she could see what happened at سقيفة and she spoke out and she knew in speaking out that it would result in her having four orphans in the house. Instead of her saying that, you know what, let's have peace and unity and let's not talk. No, no chance. How dare you treat Abu al-Hassan in this way? You take his leadership and his right after everything that he had done for the religion of Islam. And you come and talk to him like that. That lady who spoke out, it, surprised, it does not surprise me that her daughter did the same in Sham on a night like this. Allah. <coughs> that her daughter did the same in Sham. I ask you, Zainab alayhi salam, when she spoke to Yazid, what was it? Soft hearted? And Zainab literally told Yazid, You are shaitan from the line of shaitan. If Zainab alayhi salam said that today, the Shia would be like, No, no, say to Zainab, please. Don't talk. No, Sayyidina Zainab is like, why? I will talk, and I will talk with akhlaq on the issue. But haq is haq. In the same way the Quran said, Utullin ba'da thalika zaneem. Likewise, there's a time to talk about the rest of the sons of. And that's why she came in front of him, and when she came in front of him, she made it clear to him. All praise is due to Allah, master of all the worlds. Peace and blessings be on his prophet. Allah was right when he said, evil will be the end for those who committed evil. Because they rejected our communications and used to mock them. Oh Yazid, do you think God has made you honorable? And made us contemptible. Now that in your belief, you've blocked the earth's zones and the heaven's horizons and have left no solution for us. Do you think your reputation before Allah is what has led you to victory? You crow with pleasure now that the world has turned for you. Our affairs are allocated to you. 
and our government has arranged for you. Get off your high horse. Have you not read in the Quran, O Yazid? Let not those who disbelieve think that our granting them a long life is good for their souls. We grant them long life so they may add to their sins. And for them there's a painful chastisement. O Yazid, O you whose father was freed by my grandfather. Is it fair that you place your wives behind a curtain while the daughters of Rasulullah have nothing to cover them? May Allah bless all the daughters of Fatima and Zainab in the crowd tonight and all the lovers of Fatima and Zainab. Only Allah knows the way they drag those scarves of the daughters of Fatima. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the pulling of the earrings from the children of Hussein and what they did to the family. O oh, Yazid, you place your wives behind a curtain while you take the daughters of Rasulullah from city to city as captives. You disgrace us by unveiling our faces. Unveiling your faces one way, but how about an injured face, Allah? You unveil our faces so all can see us from the stranger to the acquaintance, from the noble to the ignoble, while there is none to defend us. How can I hope for sympathy and compassion from someone whose grandmother chewed the liver of the noble? Allah, I ask you, look at Zainab al-Kubra alayhi salam Does Zainab hold back her words? She doesn't, but does she say it with eloquence? She does. In a scholastic fashion, she continued with the lines until she said to Yazid, although the plight has made me speak to you. This is a huge line now. Because this is a line of a lady who's making it clear. I am the son, I'm the daughter of a man who spoke out against Dhulm and the Dhalameen. Although the plight has made me speak to you, Yazid, I find speaking to you of little value, but I find scolding you great. How ironic it is that the members of the party of Allah are killed by the members of the party of Shaytan. That line, is that not a line of sectarianism by Zainab? How could you call other Muslims the party of Shaitan, Ya Zainab? This will bring you a slap. She'll say, I've already been slapped. Allahu Akbar. There are many of you, I know you wish you were in Sham tonight, don't you? How many of you miss Sham? This is your night. How many of you wish you were by the grave of Zainab, alayhi salam? Picture that grave, those of you who've been. She said, that what? Oh, Zainab, if you say that, they'll slap you. But I've already been slapped. They might whip you, Zainab. I've already been whipped. They might chain you, Zainab. I've already been chained. You might lose family. I lost Aoun and Muhammad. For Zainab and the ladies of Al Muhammad, this night, and the nights in Sham which we honor were the most difficult ones. They were on the ground, on the floor in Yazid's palace, chained to each other. I ask you, Sukaina's neck, how is it chained to the rest of the ladies? These ladies, all of them were together. They were all on the, uh, on the floor. Yazid had asked all the officials, come and look at what I have. Even one of them said, give me that young girl there, give me her. That young girl held on to her auntie Zainab alayhi salam. The narrations mention that Yazid at the time was married to a lady by the name of Hind. Yes. This lady when she was younger, she used to be in Medina in the house of Imam Ali alayhi salam. She served in that house and then she served where? She served in the house of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. After Imam al Hassan died, Muawiyah forced her to marry Yazid alongside her brothers, forcing her. So, this lady Hind, where was she? This lady was now the wife of Yazid. She was in her quarters. Her servant came towards her. Take your heart tonight to Sham, I beg you. Her servant came towards her. She said to her, Madam, she said, yes. She said, get ready, dress in your finest. She said, why? She said, because there's a parade. A parade of who? Said a parade of rebels, a parade of prisoners, a parade of captives. She said, and where have they been coming from? She said, a place called Karbala. <laughs> 
All of us are in Karbala tonight. Said a place called Karbala. She said, very well, I'll get changed. Something wrong in her ears about Karbala. Where have I heard this name before? But for a lady who's lived in Medina in the house of Ali, she would know the name. But she got changed. She got ready. Where did she come? She sat on a mumbar. She sat there. She was on the mumbar. Where was Zainab? On the floor. Zainab chained to Kulthum. Kulthum to Sukaina. Ruqayya. The rest of Al Muhammad. All of them were chained on the ground. Zainab alayhi salam turned around to Um Kulthum. She said to her, Kulthum, do you recognize that lady there? Um Kulthum looked towards Sayyida Zainab. She said to her, I don't. Who is she? She said to her, do you remember when we were younger in Medina? Hindu used to serve in our house. Allah. Um Kulthum said, that's Hind. She said, yes, that's Hind. At that moment, Hind, while sitting on her throne, looked towards the ladies of Ali ibn Abi Talib talking to each other. She looked towards Zainab alayhi salam and she asked her, Oh lady, oh lady, where are you from? Allah. I want you all to think of one thing. How much had Zainab's face changed? Allahu Akbar, that she couldn't even recognize Zainab alayhi salam. She looked towards her, she said, where are you ladies from? A broken voice replied, we are from Medina. <laughs> How many of you wish to return to Medina, my dear brothers and sisters? <laughs> you know what she did? She got off the mumba. She got off, she sat on the ground. She sat on the floor at that moment. She looked towards them. Zainab said to her, why do you sit on the floor? She said, out of respect. <laughs> she said, out of respect for the people of Medina. When I was younger, I used to serve in a house in Medina. <laughs> Wallah with these tears. <laughs> Wallah, Wallah with these tears. Imagine your mother Fatima crying. Ladies, the lady may be with you now. She said out of respect for the people of Medina. When I was younger, I used to serve in a house in Medina. She looked towards Sayyidah Zainab. She said, may I ask you about the house? I don't know if you know it or you don't. Sayyida Zainab's akhlaq is remarkable. She doesn't scream out and say, of course I know it. She says, go ahead, ask me, I'll try and tell you. She said, I used to be in the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Do you know the members of that house? She said, yes, I know the members of that house. She said, may I ask you about them? Allah. May I ask you about some of the members of the house? She said, tell me. Tell me about Abel Fadl. Where is Abel Fadl? <laughs> How many of us missed Abel Fadl for a couple of years? Imagine the sister of Abel Fadl, how she felt. Sayyidah Zainab said, you ask me about Abel Fadl, there's the head of Abel Fadl on that spear. <sighs> Hind couldn't believe what she heard. There's Abbas's face. 
may I ask you about another member of that house? He said, tell me, where is Abba Abdullah? <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me about Abba Abdullah. In Khan Alam Yujim Kabadani and Dustin Rathatik, Walisani and Dustin Sahar, Fakad Ajabak Kalmi was a son. She said, do you ask me about Abba Abdullah? His head is not one of his head. <laughs> she had always been used to Abbas and Hussein protecting Zayn. She said, tell me, where is Zainab al-Hashmiyyah? Oh. Where is Zainab al-Hashmiyyah? Tell me. The poets give the reply, if you ask me about Zainab al-Hashmiyyah, I don't know where she is. Wallah, well, she doesn't know. Because what shared to Zainab? If you've ever been a stranger in a town, you'll say, I don't know where I am. I'm so used to my brother Abbas next to me. If you ask me about Zainab al Hashimi, I don't know where she is. But if you ask me about Zainab al Masmiya, Allah. If you ask me about Zainab the captive, then I am Zainab here.